Hi, I'm Dr. Devin Gabale. I'm a urologist with UCA Newtown. Today we are going to talk about kidney stones in general. And in particular, we want to talk about what causes it, what they do to us, and how to treat them and how to prevent them. Urinary stones are different kinds. There are calcium stones, it's called calcium oxalate. There are some uric acid stones, and also there are some stones which are caused by infection, infection stones. There are other very rare kind of stones like cysteine and all that we don't commonly see. The most common stones are calcium oxalate stones. The stones in general, when they sit in the kidney, they're silent. They usually don't provoke any symptoms. It's very rare to have that. But when they decide to travel down the kidney tube, which is a ureter, make their way to the bladder, that's where they cause a significant symptoms. It's a very painful condition. It's associated with pain, nausea, vomiting. Sometimes if the stone causes a blockage and there is an infection, it can also cause fevers. It can make people very sick. There are many reasons why we make stones. It could be part of it could be genetics. Part of it is metabolism, how we process our food. And the most important thing is diet. There are certain ways we consume our diet can either provoke the stones or prevent the stones. That basically is the background of a stone formation. You know, forming a stone, passing a stone, uh, living with a stone, this is not a one-time episode. It's a lifelong story. Most people who make one stone are likely to make another stone in about 15 years. So to prevent this recurrence of this condition and prevent having it back and back again and again and have less complications from that, we got to be very vigilant about a few things. One of the best ways to prevent stones is to keep hydrated. It's easily said than done. There are two kinds of people people who love water and people who have to be reminded to drink water. So what one does is we have to make a conscious effort to keep hydrated about, it, it's usually said about three liters a day, which sounds like a lot, but if you divide it in multiple segments throughout the day and consume this fluid, I think it's very helpful. Because stones like two things, that's where they, may, that's where they grow. One is they like a pre-existing stone because they deposit on it. They like what is called supersaturation. That means the crystals which make stones are in abundance and they like stasis, they like stagnation. So anytime there is a stasis in urinary tract, the urine is not flowing as fast and as well and the amount it should flow, that's a perfect setup for making stones. Let's talk about the nuisance stones first. When the stones cause blockage, Number one, it's painful. Number two, it can provoke infection. Number three, it can affect kidney. Some stones actually silently make their home in the kidney tube. And those are the worst kinds because they can easily be missed. So noisy stones in a way is a good thing because they attract our attention, they demand treatment. Normally stones which are less than half a centimeter, five millimeter or less, are quite liable to pass on their own. And there are some medications now. Interestingly, the medicines which we give for uh, prostate conditions like Flomax or Tamsulosin, these medicines relax the kidney tube and they help passage of the stone. So hydration, whether if one can drink, that's the best way. If one is nauseous or vomiting, then you have to bring the person in the hospital, give IV fluids, give Flomax, uh, probably cover with antibiotics and it's called expectant therapy and try and let nature take its course and pass the stone. If that happens, that's ideal. You try and retrieve the stone so you can analyze it, know what it's made out of, so you can work towards prevention in future. Let's imagine for a minute the stone is not passing. It just sits there causing more trouble. What do we do about it? In that case, you have to approach it surgically. And there are a couple, three simple ways to do it. One is internal where you go under anesthesia, up the ureter with a scope. They are very delicate, very uh, sophisticated scopes. And with a laser, we can destroy the stone and irrigate the powder or the dust out. That's a little more invasive, but a little more definite. 
At the end of that, usually we put a stent, which is like a tube which drains the kidney and protects the function. The second way to do it, if it is doable, is blast the stone from outside. Now you can blast the stones in the kidney tube from outside as well, sometime with stent or without a stent. That's, that way the stone is less invasive because the stone dusts and passes, a little more definite because you have no control over how the stone is going to behave because you have limitation on number of shocks. So let's now talk about the stones which are in the kidney, sitting there silently, not causing any symptoms. They need to be treated because if you leave them alone, they can increase in size, they can take a shape of the inside of the kidney, which is called a staghorn calculus. These are the large stones which lock themselves in the kidney. And that's probably the best time to treat it because they're not uh, making a person sick. The best way to treat it is something called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Now, the whole idea is you blast the stones from outside, like we mentioned earlier. These machines are very sophisticated. They can target the stone very well, doesn't do any damage to the surrounding organs, and then person flushes the stone powder out. That's one way. Sometimes you need more sessions of that because you're limited in how many shocks you can deliver. That's the best way. Sometimes you combine it with the other treatments, which is called sandwich therapy. If you have a large stone, you may need more than one or two sittings to clear it. The other way to deal with a large stone in the kidney is it's called, uh, it's basically called, an, uh, it is done through nephrostomy or it's a percutaneous nephrolithotomy is a fancy word for that. Basically what it means is you just make a tract inside the kidney through the skin, widen the tract all under anesthesia so it's, you have no idea what's going on and then go in and take care of the stone. You can laser the stone, you can break it with ultrasound. There are so many different technologies available that has made surgery a very different surgery uh, of today that it's much easier for the person. These are all outpatient procedures. So rarely people stay in the hospital after this surgery. You go home the same day, follow as an outpatient. And uh, you, you, I hear a word quite often and quite a few complaints about something called stent. I call stents a necessary evil in, in stone treatments because stents are basically an internal bypass to drain the kidney. And anytime you treat a large stone or a complicated stone, you need a stent to keep the kidney safe. And that's very important. Stones are a common condition. It is a recurrent condition and it's a preventable condition. If we keep well hydrated, avoid too much salt and other, you know, oxalate containing diet. And we also can take some medications or dietary factors which prevent the stone fragments come together and build a bigger stone. I think that's what we need to do. It's important to understand this condition. And if it causes trouble, if it causes pain, symptoms, complications, it's a very easily treatable condition. Most treatments are simple and outpatient. If you have any questions or concerns about urinary stones in particular or urological issues in general, please don't hesitate. Please call us, talk to us at UCA Newtown. Thank you.